So uh, I just want to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Effie McLaughlin. I am the uh, Interim Assistant University Dean for Research in the Office of Research. And um, my uh, colleague and I, Ron Nerio, the, the, also a Director of Research Programs in the Office of Research, run the Book Completion Award. We administer and sort of develop the Book Completion Award. Um, the Office of Research launched the Book Completion Award in 2017, and partly because we were looking for new and innovative ways to support faculty, particularly in the humanities and the social sciences. And we know often how important not only the first book is, but continued publications in terms of um, professional development and tenure and promotion. Um, and I have to say the Book Completion Award has been one of our most, certainly one of our most popular and also one of our most successful programs. Um, in the we received 180 uh, proposals in its first year, which of course seemed a lot to us at the time. <laughs> but then in 2020, we actually received 250 applications, which was even more. So definitely people have found out about it and a lot of people are interested in, um, and engaged and interested in getting this funding and, and get, um, applying to this program. So to date, since 2020, uh, and we announced our 2020 winners right at the beginning of this whole shutdown, in March, and um, Associate Vice Chancellor Tamara Schneider will be announcing those a, li a little bit later on. But um, we have 73 winners of the Completion Award to date since 2017. And every year uh, we hold this event to honor, and this causes some confusion, but it's to honor the previous year's winners. So we're honoring the 2019 year winners, 2019 winners in this event today because it's, it's our opportunity to celebrate the fact that their successes, their publications, their critical acclaim. Um, so, and, and as I said, we, we, um, we hold this event every year and we've never been disappointed in terms of the, the outcomes of this program. That many of our BCA winners have gone on to be published in uh, prestigious uh, university and trade presses and also have gone on to critical acclaim and book awards. So, so that's, um, this, those are sort of my welcoming remarks, but I also want to say, just because this is a new mode of uh, holding events for us, there's a few sort of um, housekeeping technical sort of uh, things that you should know about. So we have a, I have a team of excellent colleagues in the Office of Research that are helping me run this event. Um, as you might have noticed, Imani Rohn is our host today. She is a program coordinator in our office and is also our Zoom czar. <laughs> um, and she's going to make sure that the presentation runs smoothly. Um, and she, just for all of you attendees, you attendees should all know that you have been muted and also you're not able to see your screens because this is in uh, webinar mode. So you are essentially here as participants, but you will be able to participate in the chat. Um, and Rimi Dar and I will, uh, who's also a research administrator in our office, a program administrator in our office, are going to monitor the chat. And we certainly encourage you to type in any questions in the chat as we go along. We will try to get to them as many as we can. However, I do want to point out beforehand, and all of you should take a look in the bottom of your Zoom screen, because this is Zoom webinar, on the right, there is a Q&A tool. And we are actually going to be conducting the question and answer period for the panel discussion in the Q&A tool. And the benefit of this is it sort of gives us a defined space where you can ask questions to the um, presenters and they can respond to your questions and that way your questions don't get lost in the chat because sometimes I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. If you have a long chat string in Zoom, sometimes questions get lost. So we're going to use the Q&A tool for this and um, my colleague Ron Nerio is going to be monitoring the chat for that. Um, so, uh, and as I said, we hope to, but continue as we go along, if you have additional questions, put them in the chat and Remy and I will definitely, we will try to make sure to get many, as, as many of your questions as we can. We're, we hope to have a few minutes at the end to also answer questions. Um, oh, and I also should mention that my colleague Derek Steele is going to be keeping a close eye on the time, because as you might have noticed by looking at the, the program, there's sort of a lot of moving parts in this webinar. So please forgive us if we might have to, you know, cut you off or interrupt you in the middle of a question or speaking, just because we, we're trying to keep this in, in the time frame. But as I said, if, we, if there's lots of questions at the end, it's okay. As long as you can stay on, we could certainly run a little over. But I'm going to stop talking now because I am very excited to get the program started. And I want to right now turn over the virtual floor to our still fairly new uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Research, Tamara Snyder, who also started right before all of this um, came out. Oh, I'm sorry, Amani, I should have told you to put on the the webinar. So this is the program that I just went through and I am going to 
Uh, Imani, if you could advance to the next slide. Oh, wait, back one. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'd like to introduce you to Tamara Schneider, who many of you might have not had a chance to meet yet. And Tamara's going to uh, say a little bit about herself, and then she's also going to announce the 2020 Book Completion Award winners. So, uh, Tamara, are you out there? You want to mute yourself? Tamara? I'm out here and unmuted. Yay! Okay, I'm going to mute myself. Yay! <laughs> So um, really, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I first just want to start off by giving uh, thanks to Effie and uh, our other Office of Research staff, uh, Ron, Remy, Imani, and Derek, on their excellent work in getting us to this point, to this wonderful celebration of our CUNY faculty talents. And I'd like to also congratulate last year's awardees and also the distinguished panel of editors who are gonna be providing their insights with us later. So I know all of you all are uh, muted except me, but I'm just really grateful for your efforts and I give you many thanks. Oops, sorry about that. That was not meant to happen. Anywho, um, just a few words about myself. Um, I, um, I'm a, was a professor of psychology at uh, Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, there, uh, I was there for about 20 years before uh, I took an interesting path. Uh, there, I was an assistant vice uh, president for uh, multicultural affairs and uh, did some really interesting work um, about uh, really promoting and implementing some uh, substantiated practices we discovered in our NSF advanced program uh, that were focused on enhancing the uh, recruitment, retention, and advancement itself of underrepresented uh, people in STEM disciplines. Um, so after doing that for a year, I had an opportunity to join the National Science Foundation as a program director, then as a deputy division director for um, cognitive and behavioral sciences. And from there, I joined CUNY, where I'm thrilled to be. Um, there's, I mean, right now it's an interesting time to be here, but I'm so grateful to be here. I wouldn't be anywhere else uh, if I had any other, you know, if I had myriad choices. Uh, I love the mission of CUNY. I love the, va the vast and variety of talent we have at CUNY. And uh, the, the, my colleagues in the Office of Research, I'm just so thrilled to be able to work with so, so much talent so that um, you know, we can really enhance the research and scholarship enterprise. Um, and just to note, I know you all can't see me, but um, you know, I'm here, I'm here in spirit, I'm here in voice, I'm here live with you, for you. Um, so uh, one of the things that I learned at the National Science Foundation is really looking to the future of knowledge creation. And, and really our goal was always looking to what's at the edge, what's really truly at the edge, the frontiers of discovery and innovation. And how do we get there? Um, one of the best ways that we can get to those frontiers is when people from vastly different backgrounds and disciplines get together to focus their expertise around uh, vexing social issues, issues such as climate change or public health or social justice and policing. So many of these things are things we're dealing with at uh, simultaneously in a, a heightened sort of, um, I don't know, I was going to say a reality, but it seems a surrealness uh, many times. But using these different perspectives to shed a brand new light on the issue. Um, and it's a, it's a new light that was in darkness. And the only way that the light can come is because people from these different disciplines got together to talk about this vexing social issue and figure out their unique ways of looking at it. And they come up with new um, areas of inquiry, new ways of understanding the issue, new ways of addressing the issue, new ways of, of helping the public to understand. These, are, these aren't scientific issues. 
they are social issues. And so the public is inherently involved. So anyway, I just, I encourage all of you, uh, the BCA awardees uh, that I'll announce shortly, and those of you who were nearly awardees. So all of you to take advantage of your expertise to work with others and their expertise to make our world a better place. And you'll see the um, Office of Research will be um, really uh, doing strategic focus on interdisciplinary uh, cross-campus opportunities. I encourage you to participate in those um, and bring your expertise to the table. We need you. We need you. Um, so speaking of you uh, and of this book completion award uh, process, I just uh, want to rearticulate some of the things that uh, Effie mentioned earlier. In 2017, the CUNY Office of Research launched this book completion award, and it was targeted and is targeted to faculty in the humanities and social sciences. The program has generated uh, widespread interest across CUNY's 25 colleges and professional schools. As Effie mentioned, in the first year, we received 180 proposals. This year, just three years later, there's a 40% increase. We received 252 uh, proposals. And as Effie mentioned again, uh, to date, 73 faculty have been funded through this Office of Research Investment. These faculty include Helen Phillips of Brooklyn College, whose book, The Need, appeared on 13 best of book lists. And in 2019, oh, in 2019. And it also includes Sarah Bishop of Baruch College, whose 2019 book called Undocumented Storytellers has been called a must read. Winning manuscripts have been published by many different uh, university presses, including the University of Chicago Press, Princeton University Press, Oxford University Press, Stanford University Press, University of Arizona Press, and the University of Georgia Press. And in each of the past three years, we've hosted a celebration, which includes past winners, and have also uh, held a panel of editors from academic presses to discuss developments in the publishing world and provide guidance to future applicants. And that is essentially what we're doing today as well. So this celebration, I'm uh, really pleased to say, is open to all of CUNY's faculty and students and the wider academic community. It's another way the Office of Research uh, gives back to CUNY scholarship. So getting back to this year and to the 252 applications we received, proposals were evaluated based on the originality of the research project and its contribution to the applicant's field of study. This uh, program funds books that, book projects that are either in development stages, about a third go to that, or the completion stage. So we received 45 reviews from across CUNY and have selected 20 winners. That's an 8% award rate, so very competitive, um, very competitive um, competition. Competitive competition's a bit redundant. I'm not a book completion award winner, you can tell. Uh, the awardees come from 14 of our CUNY campuses, so well over half. Six of the awardees were from social science departments, including Africana studies, anthropology, political science, and sociology. 10 were from humanities departments, including art, English, film, history, and music. Other awardees were from business, education, and journalism. The Book Completion Awards provide these faculty with resources, including time, to continue their research activities, whether in the field or wherever their projects may take them. Let's find out who they are. So Mani, if you could advance the slide. Just one, thank you so much. So the first is Lisa Armstrong, 
the, uh, for the book, Happy, the story of a boy who killed. And we have next Jennifer Ball with her book entitled Byzantine Silk in the World. The next we have Habiba Bumlik for My Voice, My Image, amazing film in North Africa and the diaspora. Next, we have Daniel Campos with his book, Trans American Lives, From Mexico to Brooklyn. Next, we have Vandana Chaudhry with her book, Disability and the Neoliberal Assemblages of Body, Economy, and Society in India. Next slide, please. Other winners include Ashley Dawson for We Belong to the Earth, a Green New Deal for the Global South. Thomas DeGloma for Anonymous, the performance and impact of hidden identities. Duran Fiak for Climate Change Collaborations, Stakeholder Engagement in State-Level Climate Change Policy Making. Natalie Havlin for feeling moments, race, oh, sorry, feeling movements, race, gender, and the affective politics of alliance in Latina O cultural production from 1920 to 1980. Neil Huang for a guide to machine learning for accountants. Next slide, please. Nadia Kennedy for Mathematics and the Big Questions, Thinking Them Together. Tim Keel for Suburbs in Black and White, Struggling to Live and Work in Post-War Long Island. And Christopher Loperena for A Fragmented Paradise, Blackness and the Limits of Progress, in Honduras. IX Malki for the Lebanese in British West Africa and Ghana. Identity, diaspora, and the citizenship question. Benita Noveno for Mud to the Moon. Next slide, please. Leslie Pack. Oh, sorry, Leslie Pike for Trapped in the Maze, Multifamily Institutional Involvement, Poverty and Inequality, Catherine Pence for Gender and Consumer Politics in Cold, World, Cold War Germany, Joan Robinson for In Whose Hands, The Pregnancy Test in American Life, Christian Warren for Starved for Light, how Ricketts and Vitamin D Shaped Modern America. Emily Wilborn for Operas Others, Voice, Race, and Slavery in 17th Century. And Alex, Amanda, sorry, uh, Wonder for, I have my screen blocking it, a courier at a a uh, couturier, sorry, <laughs> of court, making Spanish fashion in the age of Velasquez. So I would like to uh, congratulate all of these uh, folks and uh, ask you to congratulate them with me. And thank you so much, Tamara. Woo! That was great. <laughs> Thank you for introducing yourselves, for introducing <laughs> yourself, and for reading off those winners. And actually, a few of the, the 2020 winners are actually participating in our blurb competition. So it's nice to just get the opportunity to include as many people are, that are involved in the program as possible. So thank you. So, but now we're going to move on to our, um, 
our Ask Up, our live demonstration and panel from our, this, the great panel that we put together of editors from university presses. Um, Imani, if you could, oh, I'm sorry. Is Tamara screen sharing? I'm seeing Tamara's screen. Oops. Hello, Imani, are you out there? Yes, I'm here. I'm no longer um, screen sharing. Um, I'm no longer screen sharing. Um, so the next is the demo, right? Oh, okay. Yes, 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 of course. I just so. wanted to read out the names of the, <laughs> the editors. Okay. <laughs> um, so you actually, all of you that are on this event are going to have the special privilege of being able to be among the first to see a new online tool that our panel of editors are developing um, and that they're calling Ask UP. And here it is. And I would like to introduce Eileen Kalish from NYU Press um, and also uh, Hisela Fosado from uh, Duke University Press, Fred Nachbauer from um, from Fordham University Press and Trevor Perry from Northwestern. And I'm, we actually gave them a few minutes. They're each going to uh, say a little bit about themselves and sort of what brought them, brought them to this project. And then Eileen is actually gonna run you through a first time ever live demo of Ask UP. And hopefully you'll have lots of good questions for her. So take it away. Who's gonna, I guess, Kisela, would you introduce yourself first, please, since we're going alphabetical? Yes, hi, I'm Gisela Fosado. I am the editorial director at Duke University Press. It actually still feels strange to say that title. I just became editorial director two <laughs> months ago. I've been at Duke Press for 10 years and I acquire broadly in a wide range of areas in the social sciences and humanities, like all of our editors at Duke Press. We're a very interdisciplinary press. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, but I acquire an anthropology, history, sociology, Latin American and Latinx studies, environmental studies, race and ethnicity, and gender and sexuality studies, uh, just to mention a few. Uh, and I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, am I next? You are all seeing the screen too, right? It is sharing? Yes? Okay. Yep. <laughs> Um, okay, so I am Eileen Kalish and I am executive editor at NYU Press. Um, I acquire in the social sciences, uh, specifically in sociology, political science, um, women's studies, criminology, uh, and I helped oversee our anthropology and we have a forensic psychology list as well. Um, I guess I've been at the press for, I think it's like 16 or so years, a very long time. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's definitely an interesting time uh, to uh, be based in New York City, <laughs> although I'm in New Jersey, so I'm, I'm not quite, uh, Fred can tell you more, although Fred's away too. <laughs> anyway, so I'm very happy to be here and I'm excited to show you all about Ask Up. Hi, I'm Fred Nachbauer. I'm the director of Fordham University Press. I've been at Fordham for about 11 years. Uh, we publish scholarly books in the humanities and social sciences, as well as trade books, focusing on the metropolitan uh, New York. Um, in addition to overseeing the press, I acquire in cultural studies, history, religion, and urban studies. Um, before Fordham, I was at NYU Press, and before that at Routledge. So I know Eileen at both of those places. We've, been, we've worked together at Routledge and NYU. And I've been working with Effie and Ron, uh, I don't know, since 2017, 2018 on the book completion. So I don't know if I was yeah. at the first. You were at the first. You're I like was. Our, you're our stalwart. So you're it's our my, go -to. my, uh, <laughs> my fourth, fourth year um, being part of the panel, and, and I'm delighted to be invited back again. So it's a really exciting um, program. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, Trevor? Hi, uh, my name is Trevor Perry. I am senior acquisitions editor at Northwestern University Press. Um, I acquire across a range of disciplines in the humanities, um, a bit interdisciplinary as well. Uh, that includes philosophy, critical theory, um, literary studies, um, Latin American and Latinx studies, um, black studies, and film and media studies. Um, so I've been at Northwestern for uh, almost four years, is it? Um, it's hard 
not remembering right now. Uh, before that, I worked for a bit at the University of Chicago Press. Um, and before that, I, after doing a PhD in philosophy, I was teaching and writing and then trying to figure out what, what to do. So I, I made my way into publishing um, that way. And happy to be here and glad to be able to talk about Ask Up. Eileen, you want to just jump in? Yeah. Are you seeing my video people too? Should I should I try to get rid of that or is that okay for people? Don't worry. Okay. Okay. So, um, so this is Ask Up. Uh, it's uh, a brand new um, site and we're giving you a sneak peek. Um, it's kind of like it's official debut. No one's really seen it before. <laughs> um, so it's kind of exciting. Um, you can't see it yet. It's going to launch in September uh, 2020. Um, but since it just, this is the occasion, we just thought we would share it with you. We're kind of excited about it. Um, and basically um, what it is, is it's a place uh, for authors who are seeking knowledge from university presses uh, to get to ask questions and to get answers. Um, and uh, it's um, it's kind of like a for uh, almost like a, a site for what we're doing today, which is to say that all of us, like Fred and Gisela and Trevor, we give these kind of panels all the time. We're always we're often asked to go places uh, and explain what it is that we do, and often the audience has lots and lots of questions um, and doesn't seem to know a lot about the publishing process <laughs> at all. Um, I think that's just a um, unfortunate uh, consequence of the lack of professionalization. Um, not everywhere is like CUNY um, that has these kind of helpful panels for uh, their faculty to help them figure this out. So this is a really great thing that they're doing. Um, and so we all know, that is to say the people in publishing, we all know that you don't really know the answers to a lot of the questions that are asked here. And so what we wanted to do was try to just get a lot of the basic information that's often asked uh, about publishing, um, get it all down, get it all out there and you know, make it transparent, make it open, uh, have a place, a resource where uh, anyone who's looking to publish either in books or in journals uh, has a place to go to ask their questions and to, and to get answers. Um, so what we're hoping is that eventually when this launches, uh, it'll be something that you see when you go to most university press websites uh, and that the content will continue to grow um, as uh, the years go on. But right now it's still just um, a great idea waiting to happen, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and who, who are the people uh, that are putting this together? Um, this is being sponsored by what's called the Association of University Presses. Um, that is uh, an organization that um, why are you not opening? Um, that not a lot of people beyond those in publishing have ever heard about. Uh, the AU Presses is, is kind of like our governance guiding organization. Um, there are over 150 uh, uh, scholarly, nonprofit scholarly publisher, publishers um, in the US and, and it's actually international and around the world. Um, a Presses has existed since 1937, um, and they're kind of like our, all the university presses are, we're all members of, of, of the organization, and they help uh, give us best practices, guide us, they're advocates for us, um, they help us to, you know, think about, well, what's the best way to do peer review, and so forth and so on. I don't know if Fred wants to add anything quickly about uh, AU Presses, because he's on the board. <laughs> No, I, I think I think you summarized it correctly, um, Eileen. It's a it's a group. I'm on the board. Actually, this is my second year as a, as a board member for the AU uh, Association of University Presses. It used to be called the Association of American University Presses, and, and they changed their name recently. I think it was like two years ago. And so they they they're really great at, at providing resources and a network for people like Eileen and Gisela and and Trevor. But this ask up broadens the, the information so it's not so insidery. So we can now share all of our knowledge with young scholars who want to get published. The other thing that um, the association does is, is also help when, when presses, unfortunately, sometimes are in crisis mode, like Stanford, when, they were, when their funding was going to be cut drastically without any notice or very little notice, the director of Stanford went to the, to the, the association and they came up with this whole crisis planning which is great, and then they worked out a plan, and Stanford's okay for the moment, fortunately. Uh, but there are other presses that are not like Stanford. They could be a state university with public funding, 
And so there's a whole host of toolkits, they call them, to help presses. So um, it's a great resource, and um, we're really happy that um, this faculty outreach committee was able to work together and try to come up with a site that will help scholars and to help university um, professors and who are getting published for the first time. And I think all of the presses here remain committed to that mission. We're mission-driven publishers. We, we do publish first-time books. We do publish for bias dissertations. We recognize that you need to get published in, in order to advance your careers, get tenure. So we remain committed to that, which is really uh, important. And we do the work that commercial presses would, would not do. And I think this Ask Up, Ask UP is really going to reinforce that whole mission-driven um, philosophy. Um, yes, well said, Brad. Um, so, um, and what he's talking about at the faculty outreach committee, a couple of us, um, uh, Trevor and Fred and I are on that, and we're the ones who actually put this all together, um, came up with the questions, um, worked with other people at other university presses around the country um, to figure out what are the best questions and answers. Um, so let me just take you through a little bit. I'm not going to do too much, but but the one thing I was thinking about is that as we look at this, if you see a question that you would like answer, <laughs> I'm not going to read you the answers now, but you could you know think about that, jot it down, and then um, later on you can ask that question. So we go through the basics, basis of book publishing. Uh, when should I approach a publisher? How should I approach a publisher? How do I get my dissertation published? Um, talk, talk to me about peer review. So if you if you click on one of the questions, then you you get a nice little short answer that um, pretty much a, a, a lot of eyes in university press publishing uh, have looked at. We tried to make it an answer that would kind of go across the board for every press. But as we always say, um, and we can't say enough, every press is different. Every press has different policies. Uh, different ways of doing things. I mean, we do all believe in something like peer review. That is, that's like a, a foundation for university press publishing. But um, contracts can be different. Um, editorial review boards can be, and their involvement at different presses is different. Um, there, there are just lots of little differences. And, and we say there's a great um, disclaimer, I think, on our submit a question <laughs> that says not all presses are alike. One policy you know, at one is, is different from another. So just keep that in mind. Um, okay, so going back, so we, so that was book publishing, we have journal publishing, like how do you start a journal? Um, should I post on academia.edu? Uh, how can I promote things? You know, why isn't all the content free? You know, we tried to get the basics. We have digital publishing, what is it? <laughs> we didn't even know if we should call it that. Um, uh, what are some questions about it? Um, similarities and differences. Um, what are good projects? Uh, there's some really good information on digital publishing here. We have some basics on contracts. Always a perennial question. Permissions, always very important. What is fair use? What are rights and permissions? What is the public domain? We could go on and on forever about that, <laughs> um, but there actually all are laws and things. Um, and then ed editorial and production is um, the actual physical making of the manuscript. So what is production? What is that? <laughs> How do they do that? How long does it take? What is, for example, uh, the difference between uh, copy editing and proofreading? All right, so these are kind of some of the basics. And then the all important marketing, which all people which people generally have a lot of questions about. Uh, how do you promote your book? What's the timeline? What can authors do? Um, always important when your book is first released, that's a key moment for your book. Um, talk about print runs, even print on demand technology. And then the all important, what are typical sales like um, for books? Um, so these are pretty much the basics. Um, we were just trying to lay a foundation. We're hoping that as things go along, more questions and more answers will be asked. Um, the way that we're going to run it is that every single season, uh, starting with September 20, uh, fall, uh, and then winter, spring, summer, we'll have a different host press. Oh, how do I get to the host press? How do I, how do I, ah, 
I need to get behind where the about is. <laughs> is that gonna work? Oh yes, it worked. Okay, the, so the first host press is going to be NYU Press. Uh, and so we're going to uh, sort of be in control, uh, I guess, for the first couple of months. We're going to launch it. We're going to have um, some, um, we don't know what yet, but something uh, where we invite people in to ask questions uh, and then we'll provide the answers uh, for the first leg. After NYU Press, it's going to go to Michigan State University Press. The MLA is going to uh, do it in the spring, and then Fordham University Press uh, ends up doing it in, I guess that's the summer. Um, but all the time, you can submit a question. Uh, right here is a place for a question, answer. So keep that in mind in the future. If you had a dilemma or you didn't know something about University Press Publishing, you could. there's a place for you to go to ask your questions. Um, so I think that's it. That's pretty much the basics. Um, uh, again, I think that um, it'll be hopefully a great resource for everyone. Um, I don't. I doubt that we'll stop being asked to give these panels, <laughs> and I hope we don't because we do enjoy the panels. Um, but it's definitely something that we'll hopefully be able to refer you to, um, and it'll help illuminate uh, more of the publishing uh, process than what most scholars seem to, to know uh, in the first place. Um, so, uh, Eileen, I, we, I, I actually, I just wanted to remind everybody, I said this at the beginning, but some of you might not have, not, not have heard it, but for all the uh, attendees, if you look at the bottom of your, um, of your screen on the right bottom toolbar, there's a Q&A session, and we are going to be conducting the Q&A uh, to the, the panel of editors on, on this tool. So if you want to ask any questions, that was why Eileen was referring to your saving up your questions. Um, do you guys, do, do, do Trevor and Hisella want to say anything, or Fred, do you want to say anything else about the tool? I mean, it's just such an amazing resource, but um, before we sort of launch into the question and answer, because actually we have tons of time. We're, we're running ahead of schedule. I'm like super efficient. <laughs> <laughs> I, just really quickly, I would add, I mean, I, I think that the tool will be as good um, or the tool will be good uh, as long as people are using it. So I would encourage all of you to, to use it um, once it is out and available. Um, I think it will be able to do a lot of good and really demystify the publishing process for you know, a wide range of people who maybe don't have that kind of you know, background knowledge or they don't have people that are telling them what they should be doing. So, I mean, I think all of us want to make sure that publishing is as open um, to as many people as possible so that we can you know, publish good work. And I should have said that you will be able to find the site on both the AU Press's website and then uh, hopefully other press websites, but certainly the NYU Press website to begin with. And the, um, the address is going to be ask.up.hcommons.org. Um, and that will We've actually there, been getting a lot of questions about that. So the site's not going to be live until September. Correct? Not until September. You're, You're just seeing previewing it for pre us. Pre sneak preview, secret access. <laughs> would it be possible? I don't know. I, we talked about this in the, the tech rehearsal, but would it be possible for Eileen, for you to share the website screen again? So then if anybody have any questions, particularly about the content on the site, could we do that? So yeah, like, you know, so just... you said, like if somebody has a question about digital publishing or something, maybe sort of. Yes. And the other thing I wanted to mention, Eileen, is the um, the great resource, like the recommended reading and all that is a mm -hmm. really good resource as well. So you may want to just show that too. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very exhaustive list <laughs> um, of all kinds of good stuff. Very helpful. So yeah, so if anybody has any questions from the audience now, from the attendees, if you want to click on the, the Q&A and there should be a, um, a box that opens up and Ron is going to be moderating this and he'll read out your questions and we can, oh, we have a question already. Ron, do you want to start? Ron, do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, uh, can you, can anyone hear Ron? No. Okay, I'll just read the question. I'm, no, I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? No, I couldn't hear you before, but maybe that was oh, just- Oh, sorry. Nice. Okay. Uh, the first question is not really a question, but really a challenge. Uh, I would challenge publishers to be less timid about asserting fair use. 
for Duke I'm not Press. sure if anybody wants to Ch take that on. I'll take it on. Challenge sure. accepted. <laughs> we, uh, it's been about a few years since we've consulted with a copyright lawyer who, who really challenged us to do the same thing. You know, co uh, fair use is a law that's really meant for scholars to, uh, to claim. Um, and without kind of claiming it and using it, um, it kind of takes the power of the law away. So we, we are a fair use first press. That still doesn't mean that sometimes people can't get an image without, without um, getting a license for that particular version of the image because it's high resolution. And if you have a license, you know, you still need to have a particular license that allows you to publish that image. But yes, fair use first all the way at Duke Press. Very proud of that. Thank you, Hisala. Uh, the next question, I really like this one. Uh, what do you suggest for, for promoting one's own book once it comes out? My book is coming out in August, and I have a couple of talks scheduled, but I'm wondering if I should try to do more. It feels like an awkward time to be promoting a book. I could take a stab at this. Um, I come from, I have a marketing background actually, um, and I really, recommend that authors not be shy about uh, their books when they publish. Uh, you've worked really hard for many, many years. So I always say, you know, promote the hell out of it. Um, if you have a strong social media presence, uh, you know, do everything you can on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, whatever your, your, your platform is. One of my lead books at Fordham uh, released the week of uh, the shutdown. It was mid-March and we were supposed to have a major event at the law school, it was written by a faculty from the law school, and uh, every every um, event was shut down. Was we couldn't do it, and and I said, oh, let's turn this around. We could really we can promote this book as a virtual Zoom event, and we worked with the uh, law school alumni association, and we got 500 attendees, more than Zoom would allow. So the overflow went on to to Facebook. So we had over 500 attendees. And it was just an amazing turnout, which we never would have had at in-person. It would have been capped at 150. So I, I say take, take this time and do what you can. Do virtual events. People are really desperate to, to, to learn, to see new things. They're stuck in their houses. They're you know, stuck seeing the same people. They want to learn and see and experience different things. So I say do, do the events. Um, and the other thing is, um, and this ties into the 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 uh, blurb uh, award is really craft your copy and make sure that it shows up in, in searches. And what we're experimenting with at Fordham is, is, is during this time of uh, you know, quarantine and lockdown is experimenting with how do you get those keywords out there, like buying you know, keywords on Amazon, targeting specific groups on Facebook, getting our books you know, targeted and actually not using publicists in the old fashioned way, but hiring these like e-technology specialists so that they do all the work for you and find these Facebook groups and these keywords and get the books out there, which is something that I didn't really know a lot about until we realized, oh, we can't do the old fashioned publicity tour and go to the bookstores and to these events. So th that's some of the advice that, that, that I have. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, Fred. Uh, so we have a number of questions also coming in on the chat. Oh, good. You got uh, Thank so, you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one question is, I've noticed uh, academics tend to write books with long chapters, whereas non-academic writers of serious nonfictions tend to write shorter, punchier chapters. As editors, which do you prefer or recommend? That would be shorter or, and punchier chapters or long academic chapters? I'm pretty sure we're all going to agree on this one. We, we love short books, short punchy books. Um, the longer a book gets, the, the less it's likely to be taught. People don't want to teach a 400, 500 page book in a course. Um, it also becomes very expensive, um, all of the printing and the paper and, you know, copy editors are charged by the page, proofreaders, there's all these costs along the way that just keep piling up the longer your book is. Um, and shorter is almost always better, in my opinion. I don't know what others think. 
So we, uh, we seem to be having a bit of an unanticipated technical problem, which we didn't know was one of the features of Zoom webinar, but apparently people that are panelists can't contribute to the Q&A. So um, uh -huh. there's been some questions that have been coming in on the chat from the panelists, but I thought that since the panelists can actually unmute and talk, I just thought maybe they could ask their own questions. So I see a question here from Shauna Brandle about publishing open access books. Do you want to ask your own question, Shauna? Uh, sure. Let me see. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested if any of the panelists want to speak to the possibility for publishing open access um, or what partnerships are available or what areas you're exploring because I write work that with the methodology section really lends itself nicely to books, but I want to have uh, my, my material, especially stuff that's about open research published openly. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you can talk about that, if there's any interest, I'd love that. Thanks. I think that I, I would say that's definitely something that varies press to press. We at NYU Press, we have something called Open Square that we launched that is a sort of like our resource, our site that will put any open access title on. Um, we've we're initiating it with most with for the most part, it's been a back list like you know, uh, previously published like long ago <laughs> or somewhat long ago books um, that we want to, you know, we want to keep them alive, so to speak. And so we're, we're putting them up there. We're actually asking, writing right now to authors to say, are you okay with this? Um, although I, and I will say that I just had a book that came in on uh, authors at the University of Oxford, I think. And just as we were going about to put into production, she said, oh, by the way, um, I'm part of this group and I signed something and it's supposed to be open access. <laughs> it's like, nice to tell me now. Um, and so we said, that's fine. But, you know, from there, someone could pr probably speak to where it came from, but there is basically a, a, a number that's out there, which is for to compensate us for the uh, loss of sales um, that might occur. Um, by making it through open access. And so sh we asked her for $15,000 um, for to subvent the book um, if we publish it open access. She went back to her, um, I don't know, UK based group and I can't remember their name and it was fine. And so that was kind of our trade off. Um, and so we will publish it open access. We will do all the things that we need to do. I believe we're still gonna publish a version that you could buy, a physical ver version that you could buy, um, but the rest of it is open access. But I, and, I, but, and that's kind of somewhat new for us and I'm, I'm sure that varies. Um, I know University of California Press has had a huge initiative in open access. Just if I could add, I would say most presses will probably require some kind of subvention for an open access um, project. Um, at Northwestern, we have a series that is um, always published in open access, and we don't require subvention for that. Um, interestingly enough, we don't really think it affects sales very much, um, and you know that's that, that is interesting. Um, there are other programs. I don't, as far as I know, the CUNY system doesn't participate in. But they may. Uh, there's a program called uh, Toward an Open Monograph Ecosystem, where university libraries are basically committing to funding, um, and this is they 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 ask for um, fifteen thousand dollars to cover all preprint costs, and then presses are um, compensated for that. So I'm working with a number of authors on these tome projects. That would be something that you could ask your university librarian about if the university is participating in this program, or even interested in participating in the program. Um, they might not yet know about it. Thank you, Trevor. Oh. Um, yeah, I had an author who was at Rice and they weren't part of Tome. Uh, you can Google t toward an open uh, monograph ecosystem and you'll see the participating presses. And Rice wasn't a participant, but uh, she went to the library and they were able to raise the money. And then the following year, they signed up to participate in Tome. So it's definitely worth asking. There's also a new uh, pilot program at um, UNC Press that a bunch of presses can participate in and that's only for history <laughs> monographs so I think these open access programs are going to be uh, um, increasing over the next few years. Yeah I asked a question is there, is there somebody in line before um, or may I ask? Uh, well I was just about to call on Jayashri Kramble. Uh, are you there? Uh, Thomas, I guess, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. Um, so I'm asking this um, from the perspective of just getting more insight about how to advise graduate students. 
And I was curious, to what extent do you acquire books and award contracts based on networks and network connections and introductions versus the sort of more cold submission of a proposal? Um, and do you appreciate when uh, faculty introduce and arrange meetings with their best graduate students? I mean, sure, definitely. And, and I would say I, you know, take it seriously when one of my senior uh, respected authors says this person is, you know, hot stuff <laughs> or really good or whatever. Um, I will certainly take notice. Um, but I'm just as happy to find people myself and to get people that I, I don't, you know, have never met um, before. So it's, it's definitely a mix of of uh projects um i wouldn't only look at people that such and such recommend you know i wouldn't i just wouldn't do that i would i'm always trying to get the best projects that i can find yeah it's a we go to a range of conferences and we're really trying to find out where the field is headed what are the conversations that people are really excited about so and meeting one-on-one -on -one with prospective authors is another way for us to really get a sense of where fields are going and uh, what work might be exciting to acquire for a press. Thank you. Thank you. I, here's one for Fred. Can Fred expand on what an e-tech specialist is? How would authors find one? Um, yeah, that's, that's a hard question. I mean, it's, it's actually very new for, for Fordham. We just found someone to help us. Um, and I got a recommendation from uh, another publisher who had been doing it pretty extensively. And uh, my friend uh, in, it was in religious publishing, uh, put me in contact with a marketing director at this press and that person explained the whole process to me. So it's still a little new for us. We're just starting two campaigns with two new releases uh, this spring, summer. So I haven't gotten the results yet of the campaigns, but you could probably do a search. And I also, if you want specifics, I could um, find out who we're using. I don't have it at the tip of my tongue right now, but I could email it to Ron and to Epi, the, the, the organization, the firm that we're using for these particular campaigns. Uh, and then that, that could be a start. Thank you, Fred. Uh, here's the question from uh, Professor Comblay. Can one of the press panelists address the right of first refusal clause that is in some or all contracts? Is it fine to ask a previous press to release you from it if you wish to go with someone else for a later publication, even if you have signed that contract in the past? We don't have those at Duke Press. We don't have right of re first refusal, so I'll let others answer. <laughs> um, yes, and, and that's definitely something that varies from press to press, either they don't have it or the clause is worded differently. Uh, like, I, I don't think I've ever seen it worded the same. Um, and you can usually, I mean, if someone, at, it is in our contract, it just, it says, we have the right of first refusal on your next book. Um, and if someone asks me to take it out, I usually say, fine, you know, it's not a big deal to us. I mean, it doesn't, it isn't really binding in the sense that you, I mean, it could be, based on our clause, it isn't that binding. It's a, sort of like a hard, a soft <laughs> uh, right of first refusal. But I could see a more binding one that says, you have to show it to us, you have to give us, a, we have to see it, you must submit it, we have to give you written notice of, of release. You know, I could see something like that being said. Um, so you would wanna read your contract, know what's in it, um, and it definitely varies. But I mean, usually, you know, if, if it, if it hasn't gone well with the press, you don't want to work with them and they might not want to work with you. <laughs> um, or if it's gone really well, but you want to go elsewhere, you know, usually if you just talk to your editor, uh, I mean, sometimes people have very specific projects. Like someone said they wanted to write a, a young adult book next. So that we don't, I don't publish young adult books, you know, so that wouldn't be something that our press would, um, want to publish even. So usually if you talk to your people, um, you can get out of it and it's not very binding at all. Okay. Yeah, I would just reiterate what Eileen said. Um, we do have it in our contract because somebody said that we should, but um, 
I always talk through contracts with authors before they sign. And if anybody has any reservations, we regularly strike that clause. Um, and if anybody has, if anybody ever comes to me and says, you know, you have right of first refusal, but I, for whatever reason, want to work with another press, I always say, I don't want to work with anybody if they feel like they can have some a better experience elsewhere, what, either because they were not happy, which of course never happens, or because they want a bigger platform for their book or, or something like that. So I mean, I think that, so I, I'm always happy to release people immediately from that um, or to strike it um, from the get-go. So I would say ask before you sign and feel free to ask um, if you have already signed. Okay, thank you. And thank you. Uh, what do you recommend to someone who is publishing a first book and is not a huge fan of social media? What was the second part of the, the question? Sorry, uh, uh, somebody who is publishing a first book but is not a huge fan of social media. So I guess what they mean is, how would I promote my book if I don't really want to engage in social media? I, I don't think it's, and it's, I think it's a great thing. If somebody has 10,000, 20,000 followers, it's really helpful to get the word out about a book. <laughs> Uh, but it's not, it's not essential, essential. Um, as someone who doesn't have a big social media platform, uh, <laughs> I mean, I might be a little biased, but you, what you really need is a great story. You need a great story. You need a great argument. You need uh, an intervention and a discipline that's going to make people want to read and teach your book. That's the essential thing. So, and, and get reviewed, you know, getting reviews really helps too. Um, so, and word of mouth. So your book, you know, we did this book called um, Who's Middle Ages? It was about um, how the alt-right and white supremacist kind of co-opted medieval symbolism. And the book came out right after the, you know, the Charlottesville um, demonstration. And it just kind of hit this, this moment and um, it got, you know, reviewed, it got picked up, it got course adoption. We had to like ship copies from the printer to professors. So it was like one of these like perfect storms that all came together. Um, and, you know, that we, you can't foresee, you can't predict, but it was, just, it was just great. And so it was just kind of this great, this great moment. Sometimes it happens and um, we, we want more of those. <laughs> But if you are good at it, you should also not be shy to promote your book on those various platforms that you, you know, don't just be like, oh, well, that's not for my book, <laughs> you know, because people will want to hear about you. And, and we all have authors who are really good at it <laughs> and have seen authors who have been able to get significant media attention because of those platforms. Um, so it might be worth taking a shot <laughs> at seeing if you could do it or what that might look like, but it definitely isn't, uh, I, I mean, it's not even something I actually really look at or, or try to figure out before I'm interested in a project. I'm just like, is this a good project? Is this a good argument? Is this interesting? Not, does this person have a Twitter file? It doesn't. <laughs> But that said, you still, it, it doesn't help if you hide away. You should still right. go to conferences, put that book on your signature line, mm -hmm. you know, carry it around with you, whatever you can do. If, if social media isn't your thing, try to find other ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a, a sort of long one, but a really interesting one. I'm not sure if the panelists have ever read books by Mark Kurlansky. He is a historian of sorts who has published with Random House. Even though his books like The Big Oyster and The History of Salt are national bestsellers. Mm -hmm. His books come across as scholarly, but they are not traditionally scholarly books. Here is my question. Kurlansky doesn't have a single footnote in his books, only a bibliography. I can't explain that. Is there some category of book that this type falls into? Regarding a previous statement by the panelist, in keeping books short, does this method even apply to their presses? Or is there some other category on the future website? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of what we're talking about, about the value of university presses, that this is a different, slightly different uh, universe um, of scholarship. And in the books that we publish, I mean, we need footnotes, we need references, we need it checked. 
And, you know, that's what we're expecting the authors to do. So, you know, he, you know, books like Salt are great. And if he's a beautiful writer, and if you can read that and, 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 and the average person doesn't even know about food, <laughs> you know, they might not, and they're looking for, they have a different uh, expectation uh, of what that book is gonna bring them. But if we were gonna do a book about salt, it would probably look and sound and be pretty different, which is nothing to say that there's anything like wrong with, with, with the trade um, nonfiction. It's just not what we actually, for the most part, do. I think I think some some of the tradier books, like some of our, our regional books at Fordham, are written by non-scholars. They written by journalists. Mm -hmm. And one of my board members explained it really well because she she's married to a journalist at the time and said scholarly books keep the gore and the grit right there at the fore. They're right there. You see all the footnotes. Where journalists they're doing all that research and they have all that citations, but it's all hidden. It's in the background, and that's okay as long as you can back it up. And we will publish you, but you're gonna you're gonna have to get peer review, and you're gonna have to be able to really back up all your statements. So as long as it's there, the guts are there, it doesn't necessarily have to be at the fore in, in the footnote. So that's how we kind of look at it for our, our trade or regional books. Hey, here's another one. Are there any tips about launching a book party given social distancing policies? <laughs> Wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the big questions at Duke Press right now, and I think it's probably the big, a big question at all of our presses. Uh, we're all experimenting. We're all trying to figure out what are, what are we going to do? What, you know, what can we do when a virtual conference happens? What's our role there? What, you know, so uh, talk to your editor, talk to your press. We're all working. We're trying to have more virtual events um, and it's a totally unknown terrain, but we're doing our best. There's another one. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say there's a there's a question on. We've been sort of trying to. Rod's been trying to juggle uh, questions from the panelists in the chat and also in the Q and A. But there, Catherine Mulder, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? She had a question about. Uh, yeah. Books being solicited. Um, I think we're all going through the same issues right now. First of all, a big, because of, can you hear me? Yes. Good, good. Okay. Um, I think we're going through the same issues right now because of COVID and you can't go to meetings and whatever, but we all work for CUNY, correct? And I don't know about the rest of you, but they have cut our, especially at John Jay, um, and I think there's other on John Jay, um, people on this, um, in this forum, um, they've cut our funding to, and especially if you're an associate or above, they've cut our funding to go to conferences to almost nothing. Um, and, um, you know, to save the conference money for the, for the, 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 the junior faculty so they could, um, um, and that's where I, um, so they could go and get, and, and get known. And, and, and that is important. And I, I, I do support that. Um, but every time I've gotten a, um, a book and I'm on my fourth book, I've been solicited for my books, um, you know, by the presses. And I have never um, tried to go to any university press, actually. I've been solicited by Rutledge twice, Anthem, and, and uh, Palgrave. And, um, you know, how do we know what, what um, how do we know what press to go to? Or how, how can we, you know, everybody says to me, if it's not solicited, forget about it, you know? So if any, anybody has any comments on that, that would be helpful. Every press focuses on different, uh, different types of publications. It, I, 
one thing I, I always tell people is to look at their bookshelves, look at their bibliography to see who they're citing, to see what presses are really in the conversation that they're having. Mm -hmm. And those are really the presses where you want to be because those presses mm -hmm. have the networks to get your book read within your readership. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are just certain disciplines that Duke Press doesn't publish in, we don't really publish in very much in political science. We do political theory, but not political. So every press is gonna have a specialization. So you wanna look at first your bibliography, your bookshelf, and then the website to see the areas of acquisition for all of the editors. Um, and we have all of the submissions information there. And as I, both Eileen and I were saying, we really are looking for an intervention, an argument, a story, something interesting. Um, and we, this is what we do. We look at proposals, dozens of proposals every month. And so uh, you should feel free. You shouldn't feel intimidated to approach us. That's, that's how we will connect with you. I mean, that solicitation isn't more or less, I don't want to say required, but really, no? Not, not, at, all. All. not, not at all. Not at all. Uh, well, then that's news to me and I'm happy to hear that. So. And if I could add to that, one of the uh, attendees has, uh, has added here, I was solicited once, but that book isn't written yet. I will have four mm -hmm. books by the end of this year, none solicited. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, whoever that person is, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because I mean, not about cutting funding, but uh, my understanding is that NYU will not pay for any travel, no matter what. Like they're just like you can't, you can't. We're not. You can't. You shouldn't be doing it <laughs> for the year, the rest of this year. Um, and you know, we're curious about what's going to happen in starting January, if that's. And it's more of a public safety issue than a, a finance issue. So, you know, so all my fall conferences have been canceled. Uh, I had summer conferences canceled too. So that for me is a great place to get projects, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I've just, I've just, you know, um, given talks and somebody said, are you going to write a book about that? And I, right. that was the first, the first time. Right. And I said, so, I am? Oh, you want to see a book about it? <laughs> and, and I wrote a book. Right. <laughs> you know, so. All right. So yeah, so that's maybe, the kind of thing sorry. we do. And the question is going to be going forward given that those opportunities aren't there, <laughs> how are we, you know, how is this going to happen? So you, in the coming year, it, it might be a, an even more reasonable time reason to be aggressive about, you know, you, that you could approach a publisher because we're, we're not going to have those spaces that we normally would. So I don't know. So Ron, maybe we can do one more question from the, from the Q and A, and then we have to move on to our, best blurb competition, but we'll definitely, there'll be some t more some time at, at the end, definitely. I mean, provided that you all can stick around, there'll be some more time at the end. Uh, okay, I have a question about multiple submissions. I have heard mm -hmm. conflicting opinions on whether it is okay to submit or even to talk with both presses at once. I will say that is one of the questions on the uh, Ask Up website, so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Trevor. <laughs> something that we're asked a lot. <laughs> Uh, because I was, I, I coordinated the, a lot of the input that we got from people, I think I can respond. Um, most, if not all presses that I know of, um, allow simultaneous submissions of proposals and having conversations with multiple editors. I mean, I explicitly tell people, go ahead, talk to, to, to people, figure out what is best for your book. I mean, I'm not, um, I, so, um, but most presses, do ask for um, exclusive peer review of a manuscript, um, which means you can talk to multiple presses, but once the manuscript is being sent out for peer review, which means you know that the press is asking for um, different people to spend time, the press is spending some money, I know not a lot, but the press is spending some money, um, and making some plans probably about where they think your book might fit. Um, I think those are the reasons that they ask for um, exclusive review. But um, if you have some reason that you would like your project to be reviewed simultaneously, you should feel free to ask. I mean, people ask me and, and, and sometimes I have been able to say yes. Usually I have to talk to a colleague first. Um, and sometimes I have said, we can't do it, but you know, let me know if it doesn't work out with the other press, I'd be happy to, to consider it then. So 
I think that that is generally the, um, the position at most university presses. Great, thank you very much. So Imani, if you could advance to the next slide, it's now time for our very exciting um, uh, May the Best Blurb Win competition. So um, we were sort of, we actually developed this idea um, in conversation with our, our, our panel of ASCII people, editors, particularly Eileen and Fred, because we were sort of, we were trying to figure out a way, I mean, since this is a virtual webinar, sort of ways to, to, to keep it engaging and keep it moving. And also because we were, we were, as I said earlier, we're always actively looking at ways of um, bringing more of our, you know, more of the award winners and more of our faculty members into the event. Um, so, uh, so this is developed as a, a, a friendly contest and actually we had a great response. Um, so there are 14 best blurb participants. And what we did is we created a slide, an identically formatted slide for each one of the contestants. And we've asked them, the reason why we have so many presenters is because we, we thought it would be fun to have each one of the um, authors, each one of the, the blurb contestants uh, read their, their slide aloud. Um, so all of these blurbs were actually sent to our, our panel of editors in advance and they have already read them and picked their top picks and there's going to be a first place winner and two runner up winners. Um, and so uh, actually Fred is going to announce those at the end. But what we're going to do is um, Imani, because she is controlling our PowerPoint, she's going to advance through the slides. And what she's going to do is she's going to um, read the name of the author and the title of the book. And that will give each one of you blurb presenters just an opportunity to unmute yourselves. And then just read your blurb. You have a minute and then we'll advance to the next slide and we'll sort of try to go through these um, efficiently as possible. So let's, uh, let's get started with the first blurb. Okay, so I will introduce Christian Smith and Amy Adam Sizik, Handing Down the Faith, How Parents Pass Their Religion on to the Next Generation. Hey, hi, this is Amy. Uh, so the most powerful causal influence on the religious lives of American teenagers are their parents, since they are so important and their approach to religion deserves to be understood and explained. Uh, drawing on over 200 interviews. Oh no. Amy, uh, can you hear us? Yeah, we lost you, Amy. Um, no. I guess I will, I'll just finish reading her blurb. So drawing on over 200 interviews and major surveys of parents from diverse religious backgrounds, as well as irreligious parents, Handing Down the Faith is the first academic book to identify the major themes, differences, and complexities concerning how American parents transmit religious faith to their children. Okay, next slide, please, Imani. Jill Belly, um, yeah. Pedagogies of Happiness, 2019 BCA winner. Hi, Jill. Uh, Hi, Jill. Happiness, <laughs> happiness and collected agendas thrive with promises of transforming self-help to social hope, but engaged critique is woefully lacking as our interdisciplinary humanist perspectives. Both critical and recuperative, pedagogies of happiness resurf excuse me, surfaces the redemptive aspects of this renewed focus on well-being and the good life. It works to align pedagogies of happiness more squarely with the utopian impulse, alternative solutions, and social justice that would allow not just for individual flourishing, but also for a collective futurity. Sarah Bishop, 2018 BCA winner, a story to save your life, communication and culture in the search for asylum. Thanks, Imani. The urgent firsthand narratives in this book reveal what happens when asylum seeking goes wrong. An applicant suffers a courtroom panic attack during her hearing. An x-ray showing a forced sterilization proves to be fake to the surprise of the woman who received it from a doctor. A teenager is denied and deported only to be murdered weeks later in his childhood home. These intertwining stories illuminate the harrowing reality of pursuing asylum in America. Shauna M. Brandel. Seldom, superficial, and soon gone. Media coverage of refugee crisis, crises. 2018 BCA winner. 
There is striking consistency in how different media outlets cover refugee issues, neither frequently nor in proportion of the severity of crises. This book combines analysis of print and television news coverage from the US, UK, Canada, and Australia with UNHCR data and national refugee policies and budgets, finding that refugee stories are covered episodically and fade quickly from media attention. In other words, news media coverage of refugees is seldom superficial and soon gone. Ashley Dawson, Environmentalism from Below. Why We Need a Global Green New Deal, 2020 BCA winner. Thanks, Amani, and thanks to everyone at the uh, Office of Research. How can we cope with today's twin crises of mass unemployment in the wake of coronavirus and looming climate catastrophe? Instead of accepting more auster austerity, we need to put people to work building low carbon infrastructure but green stimulus policies won't work if they are just for people in the rich nations. My book profiles the movement for a global Green New Deal, highlighting the radical transformations afoot in agriculture, urban policy, energy, and transportation in parts of the global south. Climate breakdown has already arrived in many of these societies. Environmentalism from below shows how people across the planet are fighting for the future. Thomas DeGloma, Anonymous, The Performance and Impact of Hidden Identities, 2020 BCA winner. Thank you everyone at the Office of Research and thanks to the uh, editors on the panel. With this book, I illuminate the deep social logic and broad relevance of anonymity. Analyzing various cases, I show how anonymity affords protection and facilitates subversion. I, re I reveal how it undergirds problematic forms of hate and discrimination, along with mechanisms of fairness and non-biased assessment. Analyzing anonymity as a counterbalance to pervasive surveillance, obsession with fame, public acts of narcissism, narcissism shame, and conspicuous consumption, I unpack the performance and impact of hidden identities. Vincent D. Girolamo. Crying the News, A History of America's News Voice, 2018 BCA winner. Thank you. Reading Crying the News, A History of America's News Boys, is like sneaking under the big top to watch a brassy three ring circus in full swing. The raucous spectacle of strikes and riots, wars and elections, panics and disasters are all the more enthralling when viewed from this low precarious angle. More than a splendid entertainment, Di Girolamo's prize-winning Pavement Up History of Print Capitalism will forever alter your understanding of the making of the American working class. Thank you. Jayashree Campbell, Claiming Identity, The Dialectical Journeys of Popular Romance Fiction and Its Heroines, 2019 BCA winner. Thank you. How are women still being entrapped in false binaries of virgin or whore? Silly femme or intelligent butch? Native or outsider? Claiming Identity addresses this question by analyzing how eight mass market romance novels spanning 1985 to 2014 reimagined a unified identity for their heroines. In defining romance heroism, it examines these characters' dialectical rejection of limitations in the spheres of labor, gender, sexuality, and citizenship, and uncovers romance fiction's own rejection of the real literature versus trash binary. Erin Mayo Adam, Queer Alliances, How Power Shapes Political Movement Formation, 2019 BCA winner. Thank you. Uh, Queer Alliances examines the extent that grassroots groups bridge historic divisions based on race, gender, class, and immigration status through the development of grassroots coalitions. The book argues that the construction of co common political movement narratives and a shared core of opponents can help expand political movement formation. However, this, this expansion often comes at a, at a cost. 
as paradoxically, the episodic nature of rights-based campaigns or rights episodes simultaneously contains and undermines coalitions, reinforcing movement divisions. Mary McGlynn, Broken Ireland's Irrealism and Ungrammatically in Post-Crash Irish Literature, 2019 BCA winner. Thanks. Um, I love CUNY so much right now in the Office of Research, and I'm really grateful also to the editors for coming today. How are instant gratification, YOLO, and social media influencers similar to their supposed counterweights, like mindfulness, slow food, and media fests? All are born of a worldview of commodified individualism. Economic austerity, reduced attention spans, Twitter, emoji, text speak, the elevation of emotion over rationality, performed outrage, Instagram's dominus, plotless videos with cute animals, recursive vines, and ASMR triggers. All this has given rise to a new, broken, novelistic form in Ireland. Barbara Gale Montero, Philosophy of Mind, a very short introduction, 2018 BCA winner. Oh, no. so okay. um, Barbara, yeah? I'm sorry, your volume is a tad bit low. Um, is it possible for you to increase the volume? I don't know. How is it now? Is it better? No? It's a, it's a tad better. Can everyone else hear her? Um, can you pose in the chat? Okay. Can anyone hear me? What is the mind? Someone else wants to read it. Okay, do you mind if someone else reads it? Okay. This is, empty. is it okay if I read it, Barbara? I'll read it. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. I'll try to do you justice. Um, what is the mind? Can science unravel the mystery of consciousness? Must your life end when your brain ceases to function? Or could uploading the contents of your mind onto a computer enable you to survive your bodily death? With clarity, alacrity, and a touch of levity, Barbara Gale Montero's philosophy of mind takes you on a dialectical adventure that will keep you thinking long after you have closed its covers. <laughs> that was good. Okay. Catherine P. Mulder, Social and Economic Democratic Communities. Amelia Romanga, Mon Dragon, and Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. It's, 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 it's Amelia. It's Amelia. Okay. It's okay. Uh, capitalism is killing us, literally, especially with the um, 2020 pandemic, COVID-19. The rich are getting richer and the poor or low wage workers are paying for it. A situation that can be abolished. Mulder focuses on three particular communities that endorse non-capitalist firms. The majority are known as worker self-directed enterprises. The organizers of these firms, i.e. the workers, uh, make every work-related decision democratically. Mulder discusses how the outcomes can produce more profitable firms, less unemployment, increased sustainability, and happier workers than in a capitalist setting. These alternatives to capitalism, which she investigates, shows that WSDEs are possible and have been for over 100 years. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria Munoz, Spanish Romance in the Battle for Global Supremacy, Tudor and Stuart Black Legends, 2019 BCA winner. Thanks everyone. During the Anglo-Spanish War, tales of love and armed form part of England's cultural myth-making against Imperial Spain, reviving visions of medieval crusade and romanticizing global conquest as a divine mandate for England's westward expansion. This black legend of Spanish cruelty circulated notions of British exceptionalism and white saviorism decades before the establishment of England's own permanent colonies in the Americas, forming a key ideological foundation of British imperialism. Talia Schaefer, 
Communities of Care, The Relational Ethics of Victorian Fiction, 2019 BCA winner. Thank you and many thanks to the judges and the editors who are here today. Sometimes we need the past to help us shape the future. Before the modern medical profession, small personal communities supported people in need, and we can explore such group dynamics by looking at the fictional case studies in Victorian novels. Charles Dickens's and George Eliot's care communities help us think about how we navigate discourse, fluidity, activity, status, and collaboration. In a stressful time, such values can help us sustain our communal relations of care. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> you should have left a buffer slide. <laughs> um, anyway, I just thank you so much, all of you. I, I hope this was fun for you, this because it was it was a, a fun experiment for us. Um, and I just so I believe that Fred is going to announce the winner. So as I'd said, all four of our uh, esteemed editors on the panel were able to review your um, blurbs, and they chose their top three picks. And what I'm hoping is that they'll also, I mean, we gave you a few guidelines. I mean, they provided us with some guidelines, which we sent to you. But um, what we're hoping they'll be able to do is, and, and Fred had also mentioned this too, about the importance of promotion, which is also on the Ask UP site. But this is sort of tied into that. But we're hoping that they'll talk a little bit about what makes for a good blurb and how to promote yourself and things like that. So they're going to sort of frame the discussion as they announce the winners. All right. Well, I feel like I should have, you know, an envelope. The Oscar goes to, um, so the first place goes to You Sarah can advance Finch. to the next slide. I'm sorry. You can advance to the next slide, Imani. Is she there? There we go. Yay. Yay. The first one goes to Sarah Bishop for a story to save your life. Um, what I thought it was very attention grabbing, uh, tells you what the book is about right away in a very riveting kind of way. Um, it, made me want to pick it up uh, and it was also it was timely um, timely as well. Uh, the first runner up um, was Yashri Kim Campbell uh, claiming identity. Um, I thought the question grabbed you, gets to the point quickly, uh, excessively unpacks a scholarly book and makes the theory sound exciting. A great example of how a UP should summarize this type of book. Um, and then the second runner-up, Sean Brandle, I thought it was a really strong first sentence, uh, sucks you in. Second, second, uh, second sentence precisely tells you what the book is about. It's a little long, could be made into two sentences. Those are my, those are my thoughts, but uh, my fellow panelists may have other, other things to weigh in about. Uh, also, is, um, is Andy out there, Andy Hunter? Are you on the, the call? Can he hear you? Um, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, yay! Auntie Hunter's here. <laughs> so I actually invited. You noticed that the, um, the 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 prizes for our May the Best Blur Win contest are gift certificates to Bookshop.org, and um, Andy Hunter, full disclosure, is actually one of my husband's oldest close oldest friends and closest friends. They went to high school together, and so I know Andy. But I also I wanted to. We were sort of trying to figure out a way to include him in this because he's been doing such great work um, supporting independent booksellers, and we wanted to be able to also support the work that he's doing and sort of tie him into the work that's going on at CUNY. And so I thought I would just give him a couple of minutes to just sort of say hi and put in a plug. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, I just want to say that it just seemed like such an incredible list of books. Everybody's doing such amazing, important work and, and just really the, the brilliance in this virtual room is really astounding. Um, so thank you all for your contribution to the, to the discourse. It's really great to see. Um, for those of you who don't know, bookshop.org is an alternative to Amazon. It's a way that people can buy books online and support local independent bookstores um, as well. We have support, we have about 750 bookstores who are selling books on the platform. You can go there and select a bookstore to attribute your purchases to um, and support them directly, or you can buy just from bookshop.org and um, a portion of the profits will be put in a pool, which is given to um, independent bookstores all over the country to help them get through. And we've seen this huge rush of support in the past four months um, as people rally around their local stores and try to keep them around and keep them their doors open, 
and make sure that they get through the COVID crisis and are able to reopen and don't have to lay off their staff and all that. So it's really been amazing to see the, the level of support. So I hope that you'll consider um, shopping there and um, maybe we can get a CUNY uh, book list up there to feature on the homepage to, to give some- That would be great. <laughs> yeah, CUNY yeah, book list. Um, thank you so much, Andy. Um, and I guess unless, uh, I'm not, I hope Remy and Oran is, is checking the chat because I see there's a lot of activity in the chat, but we could, um, what time is it now? It's exactly 4.31, so we exa ended exactly on time. So if anyone wants to sign off have, this. I have just one question quickly. Um, is there a way that we can um, get the three blurbs from the winners somehow? Or can you like yeah, yeah. tell them to us? Of course, we were actually, we'll make this, we're recording this webinar and we'll also make the, we'll probably put the PowerPoint on our website. So oh, all that'll the materials, be great. that'll be great. Uh, well, actually, you know, if you looked at the program, I you know, I didn't even mention this, but I hope all of you received our program that we put together, which lists, I mean, as much as our sort of like graphic design, our limited graphic design capabilities, we put together a program with all the 2019 winners. With, oh, I don't think I got that. But that was linked to the, um, that was linked to the, the, the link. it was attached to the um, link that we sent out for the event today. And we'll also put it on our website. Um, um, but yeah, so all the, the all of the 2019 winners are in there uh, with links. If the, many of the books have already been published, um, some of the books are going to be published very soon. Um, but if anyone wants to stay on for a few more minutes to maybe ask a few more questions, we can stay on for longer as long as the panelists. I, I guess Gisela had to get off. But if um, if anyone else wants to stay on, otherwise we could. Say goodbye. <laughs> Is anyone, Ron, are you following the chat? Ron and yes. Um, so there are only a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, one is, how much should the author be doing to get reviews? Yeah, you'd mentioned, um, uh, Fred, you'd mentioned that getting re reviewed is really important. So I guess the question is, is that- Yeah, I mean, I, you, I think if yeah. you, well, definitely fill out your author questionnaire. That's a really important part of the, the marketing process. So you'll get one um, early on, either at the contract stage or right before you deliver the manuscript for production. And to fill out that author questionnaire, and it'll ask specific questions, including um, who should get um, review copies, who should be sent um, page proofs for, for blurbs, for like uh, pre-publication endorsements. So fill all that. If you have um, contacts in whatever media, whether it's traditional print or blogs or newsletters, definitely reach out and help your publisher as much as you can. So use your contacts and definitely uh, communicate with your publisher, your editor, anything that you do so that they're in the loop and they can then uh, you know, do their part. If you, if you don't have a social media presence, your publisher does. So they'll send out links to reviews, they'll send out links to events. So just keep your, your publisher informed and communicate with them on a regular basis. That's really important. One little tip too, I would say, is you should all be in touch with your, you, the university, well, CUNY, like or your school, they, they have publicity people or you know outreach public relations people, but also wherever you went to school, you know, you should also, they love to help alumni. <laughs> they're, they're really excited about alumni and you can oft, often get um, the, your, um, the institution that granted your degree to issue press releases on your behalf, which is, which is nice. The more attention that you can get um, the better. And sometimes too, if a book is about say Washington DC, but you, you know, you're based somewhere else, you know, you, if you have contacts in Washington DC, you should let them know, hey, I've just written this book and I think you might be interested in it. And, and then reviews can come about that way too. So there's a request to have uh, Sarah Bishop's uh, top prize winning blurb place back on screen. Imani, can you do that? <laughs> and while you're doing that, I'll go on to the next question. Uh, this one might be a very big question. This is uh, this could take a while. 
um, but maybe there's a way to answer it quickly. Uh, I'd like to discuss the future of scholarship and the transformations that are needed or forecasted in scholarship. Wait, that might that be a little bit of a... Wait, say that again. Uh, <laughs> so the idea is to discuss the future of scholarship and what transformations are needed or forecasted that may be uh, in terms of what might be needed in terms of university publishing, uh, what kinds of transformations should be in the offering. I guess this might be related to some of the questions that you and I have had before, Fred, about sort of, I mean, I might be going for the tangent, but the, like, what's going to happen with, you know, everything uh, with E, I mean, like talking about e-publication and sort of uh, things like that and what, you know, when people, Let's get out of the books, I guess, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that could be a whole other panel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but, but I think that um, the university presses are, are trying to adapt to this, this changing landscape with these initiatives like Tome towards an open monograph ecosystem and the sustainable history monograph pilot, where we're open, humanities and social sciences are open to the idea of open access, but being funded through other other resources, other channels, so that you know, there's a lot of expense that goes into making a book. You know, from acquiring to peer review to copy editing to all these these different things, and we're supported by our parent institutions. So having the funding to help do this kind of open access is great, and I think more and more of that's going to come about as as these things unfold, as the future unfolds. So I think we're we're slowly getting there, uh, but just being open to new new formats and new ideas for open access is, I think, a really good start. Great, thank you. Uh, and there's one last question. In the meantime, Imani, do you want to put Sarah Bishop's uh, blurb up on screen? Thank you. Uh, and so the last one is, um, say that you give a copy of your blurb early on, but the project has changed by the time of final submission. Is there time to revise the copy? How did they give a cop? What does that mean? Give a copy of the blurb early on, like the who? Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure, but maybe Victoria, do you want to ask the question directly? Yeah, so I was just curious because um, I got the questionnaire early when I was working on the manuscript for initial peer review. And since I've responded to peer review feedback, oh. the book has changed. And I, th I mean, I think it's grown and matured, but I'm just wondering now when I submit the final manuscript like in a few days, do I uh, add another copy or? Do I yeah, definitely. If you have a better, if you have better copy, I mean, it's one reason why it's often easier to write the introduction last, or really you should be rewriting your introduction because you should have written it first, but then you go through the book and you rewrite it. <laughs> you write it again. Yeah, right now you know what your introduction should really say, right? Um, because you've gone through the book and you have a much better sense of what the book is about. So yeah, if you have better copy, absolutely. And your publisher will want that for sure. Thanks. Great. Is that all the questions, Ron? That is uh, more, yeah, that's more or less all of the questions. There were lots of comments about how great the blurbs sounded. <laughs> How much how great all the titles sounded <laughs> but they were not questions they were praise <laughs> well thank you so much i mean for all the people still on here for all the attendees and particularly for our panel and all of our blurb presenters thank you so much for participating in this this was sort of an experiment for us and i think it went okay <laughs> thanks for having us thanks for letting us yeah. preview yeah, yeah, yeah thanks, great. and definitely it. so let <laughs> us know um you said this won't be available until september so you'll definitely know, let us know when it goes live yeah, it might, it might go live, it might like appear. We're, we're actually, the whole AU Press is, they're launching, they have a whole new website launch. So it's sort of like we're waiting for them to launch it all and then this is a piece of it. So that, hopefully that happens this summer. So may, it could be a little earlier, but you know what I'm saying, like about yeah. the launch. It will right, have well, a launch. Okay, yeah. oh, launch, yay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, well, that'd be great. So let us know as you proceed with this, but thank you, thanks again so much. And I thank think you. we're going to log thank off, and I you. hope the rest of you, okay. rest of you have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Congrats. Thank you. thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.